When people think of the 20s, they generally think of the words gangsters, mob, and crime. Some of the most famous American gangsters and infamous criminals, such as Bonnie and Clyde and Al Capone, for example. Yet, Sydney, Australia had some of its very own infamous. One of those criminals was Sid Cowley, who was known for making a fortune in illegal gambling houses. He was found dead in his mansion at 48. Another man was William Stanley Moore, who was an opium dealer and traded drugs when Sydney, Australia was well known for its opium dens. The rumor at the time was that white girls ran off to live with Chinese men they met at those dens. Philip Henry Ross was a cocaine addict who actually posed as a doctor to trick chemists he visited into giving him the drug. For the longest time, his criminal record was clean. But he finally gave in to the police and told them he couldn't live without cocaine and there was no use lying about it anymore. Sidney Skookerman was known for defrauding department stores with fake checks. William Monroe was a thief and Walter Smith was a known burglar. What do all these men have in common besides a life of crime? When they were captured or caught in the act, Sydney's Central Police Station took each of them in to get their mugshots taken. Mugshots were a popular thing during the 20s. There are nearly two and a half thousand photographs taken by the police department from the years 1910 to 1930 that are now property of the Historic Houses Trust. The six men listed above were chosen by American artist Dana Keller as his subjects for turning their iconic black and white photos into color. Keller has gained fame by turning other black and white pictures into color prints, especially his photos of Abraham Lincoln, Albert Einstein, Winston Churchill, and more. He told a magazine reporter that there is a certain art technique when it comes to colorizing photos. There are so many colors in the skin, and it's tricky to get those just right, especially when going off a black and white photo. Colorizing the photos makes the people in them look like they could still be around today. Black and white photos prove we have sort of a cultural barrier, since people these days are so used to photos being in color. The curator in charge of the Sydney criminal mugshots, Peter Doyle, said that the collection depicts people who were on the streets only hours before being brought in to have their photos taken. There is kind of a wildness about them. If a policeman was to take a photo of an inmate, there would be a huge difference. It was as if the newly arrested criminals were allowed to pose or look however they wanted for the photos. The first photo Keller decided to work on was Sydney Kelly's. The chosen picture was taken in 24. Kelly was arrested several times in Sydney and Melbourne for the razor slashing of rival gang members. While the historic houses trust description of Kelly doesn't seem so bad, he was actually quite a disturbing character. He was known, especially throughout the 30s, to stand over the people he intended to rob. He had his weapon of choice, and if people didn't give him the money, he would slash them. Kelly had hung around Melbourne's worst criminals, such as the psychopath and ladies' man Leslie Squizzy Taylor, and gunman and thief John Snowy Cutmore. In 1928, Kelly attacked a prostitute named Betty Carslake by taking a razor to her face. The suburb where she lived, Darlinghurst, was dubbed Razorhurst due to the attacks by the cocaine gangs. Kelly ended up getting away with the Carslake attack due to the fact he had an associate, Gordon Barr, who took the fall for him. In 1929, Kelly and two other men raped a prostitute named Macy Wilson in an abandoned house. Once again, he was never caught for this crime. He lost a fight with a rival, John Penfold, after arguing with Kelly's girlfriend, Poppy Curdy. Kelly ended up coming back with several of his own thugs and his brother to slash Penfold's face. Kelly was given five years in prison for the crime. Once Kelly was released from prison, he returned to Sydney and set up illegal baccarat dens. The gambling made Kelly his fortune, which he eventually used to pay off other gangsters and even police for protection. 
After earning enough money from the gambling business, he bought a mansion. That mansion is the very one he died in alone after having suffered from a heart attack.